thanks everybody for coming today uh, out of pure interest. I'm assuming that most of you are here because you want to know something about this from a personal perspective. Whilst we're benefiting from people sharing their business perspective, most of us are interested in this from our personal perspective because that's the perspective that we're all going to have to deal with over the, over the next number of years. So for me, uh, oops. So for me, uh, whilst I'm, I am the CEO of ASO, uh, I'm not here in the ASO capacity at all. I'm here as a normal Australian. Now I know about not being pure. I'm not a pure Australian, but I am a citizen. So, uh, but I, I'm just a normal, everyday Australian, and I'm speaking today and sharing what I have to share today uh, from that vantage point and looking at the last 10 years of this. So just a bit of agenda for me. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about me, my EV transition journey, talk about the landscape into which FEMS exists, particularly from the Electrical Vehicle Council report lately. I'm going to compare my 2013 model, 2018, and 2023 model that I just got and experience from doing that. Talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, my personal reflections. <coughs> Limitations of FEV technology versus the infrastructure availability, which I, I might just briefly uh, cover since that's been addressed well here. And lastly, make my pitch for what is the case in place in 2023? Who are FEVs really best for? So I just picked up my latest and probably what's going to be my last plug-in hybrid. There probably won't be any more plug-in hybrids, I think, in about five years. Now, because I'm an engineer and I'm obsessed with control variables, and I had to have the same model, the same make, to complete my 10-year study, this possibly was an irrational decision, or so my CFO in the front row has told me. <laughs> However, um, I do want to tell you, I've only had this latest model uh, for the last week and a half, so I've been anxiously taking as much data as I could possibly uh, take, and I want to share that with you now. Did you draw a metal line? <laughs> no, I, no, I didn't. <laughs> now, uh, personally, uh, I'm into the electrify everything mode here. I'm teaching my children, one, how to earn their place at home, and two, about how to transition from dirty powered uh, vehicles to uh, electrical powered vehicles. And um, my house, uh, I've done as best as I could to follow uh, the industry trends. I do have solar at home, I do have battery at home, and I do have, obviously, an EV charger at home, being an EV family. And uh, that has to somewhere fit, all of that equipment has to fit somewhere in my house. Um, in addition to all the 500 scooters that are at my house, I also managed to get myself an electric scooter. So I'm all about the e-mobility. Um, and they're all around me too. Um, my neighbors have plug-in hybrids. My neighbor immediately across from me, uh, my neighbor immediately to my left, they also have plug-in hybrids. And one of my neighbors has an inline hybrid. But we've been comparing, especially over COVID when we couldn't talk to anyone else except across the road, we had a lot to talk about with this journey, and it's been really nice to actually have some people to share it with, and I'm excited to talk to some of you about it today as well. Um, you also find it at work, some of the ASO team that's here in the room today. Um, some have series hybrids, um, a couple of us have plug-in hybrids, and we're really trying to just normalize before we make any conclusions. So I'd like to, uh, just a, a nod here to Ross, uh, I want to talk about what the Electrical Vehicle Council has put out just to put FEVs on the road map. You can get this from a QR code on his stand. I was there earlier, so please go grab this report. So if you actually have a look at the state of electric vehicles today, um, if you look at the top 15 models, only two of them are actually FEVs. And that's pretty consistent with what the data is starting to show. If you look at the increase, the vast increase of electric vehicles, pure electric vehicles, I don't know about that, but we'll call it that for now since it, the term has been used. But if you look at them compared to plug-in hybrids, you'll notice that we're just getting left in the dust, any of us plug-in hybrid people, because the case in place for what we need is shrinking rapidly. And obviously you can see that in the previous one, but here's sort of like a zero to 100 for those who are into graphs. Here's the zero to 100. Um, you can see as a proportion of the pizza, sorry, I'm New York Italian, I can't open. As a proportion of the pizza, you can see that FEVs are shrinking up to yeah, year to date. Um, but regardless of the fact, my daughter still nicknames my car Evie. 
And every one of my fans has been called Evie because that's what it says on the front. So she thinks it's named Evie. <laughs> so we've just run with that. So whilst my daughter claims that I drive an EV, uh, not everybody agrees with that, um, using this pure language or not. But there's a lot of different variations out there. There's obviously uh, pure electric vehicles, but then there's a bunch of variants in between that are hybrid and various forms of hybrid. But some people are really taking pop shots at this, saying, hey, plug-in hybrids are fake electric cars built for lab tests and tax breaks, not real driving. Woo! That's a, that's, a, that's a tough call. But uh, some industry partners, I don't know if anyone from Enervest is in the room, but Jason, uh, Jason from Enervest gave me a hard time recently. He said, you don't have the best of both worlds. You have the worst of both worlds. So I thought, oh, man, that's a challenge. I'm going to talk about that at all energy. So here's my conclusion. <laughs> Fed is a transition technology whilst we wait for battery electric vehicles to be available, affordable, supportable, and infrastructure abundant. Until then... What is the case in place for plug-in hybrid? Well, first of all, you need to have some money. Uh, if you look at a plug-in hybrid, I mean, you look at where my car, I'm a Mitsubishi Outlander guy. I have no shares in Mitsubishi, by the way, even though I bought three, they owe me shares, I think. But if you look at the price point, for me to get what I want and what Ross needed, uh, I needed to be at least at the $60,000 range. Now, obviously, there's a few others. If you want to spend half a million dollars on a Ferrari plug-in hybrid, that's fine. But uh, I don't know why at a Ferrari level you'd be going to plug-in hybrid. Really? I, I mean, if you had half a million dollars, I'd be doing something else. But regardless of the fact, here is the landscape. Here's what it would cost you to get hybrid at the moment. But that's a challenge for a lot of people. People that want to start on the electric vehicle journey, but like it costs a lot of money. It's hard to, hard to break in. I can't get a low cost um, plug-in hybrid at the moment, um, especially the kind that I'm looking for. Now, there are financial incentives now, but <laughs> look at the fine print. Thank you very much, Ross. Um, only variants which don't have the luxury car taxes charged are eligible for FBT exemption, which is really important for me right now as a business owner. And also, FEBS will no longer be eligible after April 1st, 2025. So the time for this maybe is now, but it's not going to be now in only a couple short years. So I just want to make that point. Now, thank goodness for this. Who's in Victoria? Oh, man, I cannot believe it. I was kicking my heels when this happened last week. Thankfully, we're no longer being penalized at the pump and by Vic Roads. So anyway, I'm grateful that uh, they're stop stopping to tax me twice. Now, what do I do with my FET? Let me take you on a bit of a tour around Victoria. So I live in Ringwood North, right near Kwame Reserve. I'm not giving you my address. So for all the Mitsubishi people that want to know where my house is after this, I'm not giving you my address. But this is roughly where I am. Here's my general uh, distances that I need to travel. I often go to Richmond for work. I do that about twice a month. Round trip, 63 Ks. I often go to Camberwell to visit some partners and also I go to church there. Round trip, about 50 Ks, twice a week. My school run, this is what I do every day. So I do this run to school to drop my kids off at the Christian College at the top left and then I go to Azo, which is near Heatherdale Station and then back to Ringwood North where I live. I do that every day. That's about a 20 kilometer round trip. And if I just go to work and back, that's a 12 kilometer round trip. That data is gonna be really important for when you see my experience. A Couple more trips that I have to do. First of all, sometimes I have to come down near here. Unfortunately, MCEC parking had no charging for me today, which is very frustrating. But if I have to, have to visit my customer at Equinex Data Center, thankfully they do have charging for free right out front. If you look at the round trip, 78 kilometers round trip. So thank you to Equinex people. Uh, if I have to go down to Main Freight, down in Dandenong, thankfully Jet Charge has some chargers there that are also free for visitors. That round trip, 66 kilometers. So if you think about what I need to do to make that work, let's take a really long run. If I have to come somewhere down near here, my best shot as a Mitsubishi FEV owner is to actually charge at the Ampol station at Altona, which is just a little bit further on, but because my car currently in the previous model have a Chatamo port, I can get some DC fast charging. Generally speaking, super easy. It also happens to be that ASO controls the microgrid that makes that actually possible. So that's a little bit of an incentive for me to try it. But I was going here as a normal citizen who wanted to get back without touching my fuel tank. 
So in order to do that, I had to charge when I got there. Unfortunately, very limited. It took me 20 minutes just to get five kilowatt hours out of 14 kilowatt hours total. Wasn't great, took a really long time and I still ended up on fuel. Well, forget going back to Adelaide, Tim, forget going back to Adelaide, plus with three kids, there's no shot that I'm adding to my existing eight and a half hours that normally turns into 10 with kids. There's no way that I'm gonna add another two and a half or three hours of sitting there charging and trying to wish that my kids didn't uh, stay, or stay to sleep. So this is a real problem for me as a family person. We can't even go to Eastland and charge my car because they only prefer Teslas. And they you know, talk about discrimination. What's going on? <laughs> so not only discriminate against Americans, they also discriminate against Fevs. And anyone that's not a Tesla, so anyway. But what I really need, the real problem in my life is, what do we do if I get stuck, there's no chargers, or like this was in WA, what happens if there's no actual room in the grid, or there's a breakdown or a problem like, we, like was mentioned just earlier, what does my wife do without a backup plan? She's totally happy to drive pure EV, but when the kids are zonked out of sleep, you know that's a ticking time bomb. Because when they wake up and you're not home, you're going to be in trouble. So this creates a lot of range anxiety for us. So that's a bit of some of our personal experience. So let me talk about some data sets with Azo. So this is probably the only time I'm going to have all three models at the same time at Azo to put them next to each other. So let me show you a little bit about what Mitsubishi has done with their plug-in hybrid. And again, I have no shares in Mitsubishi. So Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, each time they try to change a few things, make it a little bit better. The real big change with this year is much bigger. It's, much, it's actually a bigger car. Also, that they've obviously added a lot more tech. Doesn't add a whole lot to it, but just like Ross, we need towing. It's just what happens in a family situation. So all of them needed towing, but it seriously impacted our ability to do towing because towing, when you run out of EV with a little tiny four-cylinder, is a sound that you end up hearing quite a lot. Thankfully, they've, they've improved their charging technology, so there was always a space for it, but a Type 1 in 2013, Type 1 in Chatamo in the 2018, and then just upgraded to Type 2 in Chatamo in 2023. But every time, 3.7 kilowatts. That just happens to be what my Tesla Powerwall is able to punch out. So if I want to do full self-consumption without pulling from the grid while I'm charging at home and use my battery diverted from my solar, that's actually a decent charge profile and actually won't kill my battery. It's probably it's not, not a, it's a pretty good number. Um, and also, obviously, uh, thanks, thankfully, you can get Type 1 to Type 2 converters, so thanks to Jet Charge. So here's a couple of things that I found. One, on the larger one, when I'm at a full charge and full tank, I can go 80 kilometers with my newer one, but I only get 86% pure EV off this 13 kilometer drive. That is because of the hills. Now I've got the engine carrying a lot more battery, it's double the size, and they also increased the fuel tank size. So I got a lot more weight to carry, and now every time I go up on a hill to drop off my kid at school, the regenerative braking doesn't offset kicking in the battery to top up for that little bit of extra power. So I've noticed a decrease in efficiency. Now I'll also just note, um, I did not take these photos while I was driving 59 kilometers. That's my virtual assistant that's in my passenger taking the photos for me, I promise you. I did not take these photos while in motion. Um, some stats coming out, fundamentally, there's a dramatic reduction now with the bigger FEV, with more fuel, dramatic reduction. A lot of my trips are actually a lot worse than they used to be when I was in the high 90s, and my fuel economy is significantly reduced. The battery management, also after charging, because I can't immediately drive as an EV, the battery is not available for like the first 10 or 15 minutes while it cools down or deals with the electronics. So that was a real surprise to me that EV mode is not available. Meantime, I'm at 100% charge. Also, what I found, today's trip, even into RE+, one complete charge. Whilst it reports quite a lot of charge available, what I've actually noticed over the years is it doesn't have as much available as I actually thought, and it ends up actually becoming more challenging. Um, I can't actually do as many kilometers now as I did when I first bought the car. Um, obviously, battery effectiveness is still good, running on battery only. This is like pure EV mode. Um, regenerative braking is still doing its thing. But 
if I turn on my air conditioning out of that small amount of charge distance that I have, um, I lose eight kilometers of range just by turning on my air conditioning. So that's a real consideration for driving with your windows down, uh, windows down AC. Same thing, 2013, 2018 was the same exact impact. Now here's my real problem. I'm a chargeaholic. My name is James, I'm a chargeaholic. So you can admit that, you gotta start off that way. I don't know any of you, I just plug my phone in every time I get a moment. I just, because obviously running a business, this is my main thing that I work from. Anytime I need to see a charger, I put it on there. That was actually not a good idea for my Fed. It actually worked against me, and it's right there in the manual. Unfortunately, I actually killed two of my batteries because I'm a chargeaholic. Um, if you look at year 10 now of my 2013 model, when you look at what it thinks it can do, even now at 2010, the degradation, it, uh, uh, sorry, the 2013 model, at 10 years, it thinks it can do 30, and in reality, when I travel 23, I only got 18 left. My battery is, is I've kind of broken my battery a little bit because I've charged it all the time. And here's the real challenge during, here's the COVID challenge. So just for your data set here, if you look at my charge profile during COVID, because I couldn't go anywhere, I was in the big, uh, the steel ring or whatever we called it here. Unfortunately, because I was at home, my 2018, I had two years of normal use, 20, 2020, 2021, and most of 2022, I sat between 90 and 100 state of charge all the time. I never cycled my battery, and lithium ion batteries like to be cycled, and you want to use it, but I was actually, well first of all, I couldn't go anywhere because I live in Melbourne, but besides not being able to go anywhere, I have charging at work, I have charging at home, and because I have I don't, range anxiety challenges, I always am plugging in. Well, what I've had to do now with this new model is go, well, I actually don't need to charge all the time. I actually let, let the battery go through its full cycles and I'll actually do better. Well, we're learning this from other things. Obviously, anybody that's got an app, a new Apple phone, Apple is doing this, it's staggered charging, it's calculating when you're gonna need a full charge. I think we need EV charging technology to do that. I don't wanna think about that, I just wanna plug in. I want you to learn my patterns and adjust it for me so I, don't, so I can plug in when I think about it and you guys don't kill my battery. Now, Mitsubishi said that 22% was a normal degradation. Um, I don't think so. Most people say that you should be able to get 2%. Maybe the Evo Power people can tell me 2% degradation year on year. I'm not sure. But that is what happened to me. So I highly recommend taking this into consideration if you want to extend the life of your battery. So a couple of quick tips here. Use FEBS most of the time within its EV only range, unless you're going on a longer trip. Ensure you regularly recharge your FEV battery in a responsible charge cycle and avoid the option to selectively recharge using your engine. Obviously, it's not good for the environment and it's also not good for your battery unless you really need it, like going to the snow or something like that. So those are some tips. I'll just put them up there quickly because we're almost out of time. So avoid discharging below 20%. Avoid charging over percent daily. Uh, charge your car at the right temperature, especially if it's in a hot garage. Make sure you're charging your car at the right temperature. Don't be a lead foot, which I'm not, but some people are. And limit your DC fast charging sessions only when you really need them. So limit, if you got a chat remote port, limit it. Uh, please don't kill your battery. And people anticipated this. 13 years ago, there was a study actually done on this about plug-in hybrids, and they called this exact thing out. They looked at how the degradation of the battery was going to uh, perform over time, and fundamentally, they were planning on this regular reduction, but behavior directly impacts your ability to get longevity out of your battery. And if you got a FEV, you got a small battery, you need to make that thing do as much as it can. Now, please, um, Mitsubishi Febs are vehicle to grid ready with a firmware update. Can we please have a charger and some legislation to allow me to do this? I would love to be able to have my car participate in the other things ASO is built. Well, I didn't get ASO in. I said I wasn't going to. Here it is. So I want to be able to put my car as part of these virtual power plant trials. I would like my car to be able to participate as long as I can say by 5 o'clock I need 80%. Do what you want with my battery, 
give me some trade-off for my reduction of battery life, make it financially possible, and I'll give you my mobile battery storage. You could also use my storage at home, but now I've got some DERs that can be contributing to, uh, to the output. So obviously what we're wanting to say everyone, we, we have only have a certain amount of resources, this is only on the ABC last week, we've only got a certain amount of nipple resources, um, we need to consider maybe there's a place for FEVs to be able to get us 97% pure EV um, and then get five more people than I need actually having the ability to go 97%. So we need to make sure that we uh, use these electric vehicles in a hybrid way but also balancing resource availability and resilience. That's no different from the microgrids that are getting built by PowerCore, funded by Dell. There are also just a small amount of diesel backup generation being used so you don't have to build batteries the size of this room for those 3% of the time that you actually need it. So some people are looking at the true cost impact as these FEVs get a little bit bigger and obviously the manufacturers know that and people are starting to know that too. So when you look at the changes between people making a switch or not making a switch, this is what's happening. Some people are starting with FEVs and then graduating, as it were, to pure EVs. But guess what? Not everybody is doing it, like Ross and me. There is some case in place where a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle does make sense. So let's just, uh, just I want to conclude with this by saying, obviously, oops, this is my view, but I'm just going to quote from Cars Guide. FEVs are often considered an ideal middle ground towards the transition to all electric vehicles as they will familiarize drivers with electrification and demonstrate the practical advantages of all electric. So, highlighted benefits. They can achieve significantly better fuel economy than traditional cars, especially for short trips. They produce lower emissions than traditional vehicles when operating in electric mode and using ICE. They offer flexibility of a traditional vehicle, which is what I need as a family man, with the added benefit of operating electrical power for short trips, and FEVs can operate emissions-free when necessary, while also maintaining extended range while using diesel and biofuels. So for me, what's the case in place? A local SUV option with infrequent long hauls, charging at home, or work with solar. So which one is the winner out of my shootout? Well, it's the one that I want to sell today. So I want to offer you a 50% discount on this 2018, which is the clear winner. Hashtag your best fev now. Thank you for your attention.